गुड इवनिंग बच्चों वेरी गुड इवनिंग वेरी वार्म वेलकम सो टूडे सेशन जस्ट डे वॉज वेरी हॉरिबल डे आई कूडेंट इवन टच टू इंटरनेट बट टूडे इट्स वर्किंग स्मूथ सो फार सो फॉर दोज प्लीज फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल थम्स मी आप इफ माई साउंड इज ओके एंड यू आर एबल टू सी माई स्क्रीन एट फोर एटी पी क्लियरली एंड विजिबल एवरीथिंग इज ओके then we are good to go hello abhumika shilpa sanika sneha momita somdata ishpita archana upender arushi diya kunal devashmita sham shambhavi shambhavi bhavya supriyo Uh, that's good i can see that uh, you are all from some of from west bengal from north south hina abhay shrivastava mehak racha mehak garg uh, swarndeep abhay shrivastava i really want that i could understand from where you are what are you studying what are you looking for in the future if i was able to have that introductory part in our earlier classes we used to have a less number of students then we were able to talk with each other and and discuss many things in details but uh, having uh, a range of 170 students uh, it's very hard uh, for us um uh to 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 uh, have interaction with each other but somehow and students some of you could be my uh, helping hands here uh while we are teaching if somebody is asking questions please first of all you feel free to ask questions while the lecture you are you are open to ask things any kind of things uh from your career perspective or any technical issues or any technical questions you are having uh just write it down 
if I'm not able to reply while giving my lectures. So I request some of you students, if you uh, know the answers, please reply in the chat box itself. So that while I'm uh, continuing my slides, uh, your chat box is also working. Then uh, after the one chapter is over, I will come back and see your questions. In this way, we are having an interactive pattern. Uh, it was supposed that we should switch to Google Meet, but it's not possible as the range has reached. Uh, still students are being added. So it's been 170 students now from 140. So that's how it has to be on YouTube streaming for all means. So at the moment at 1903 it is. At 19.05 we will start. That's why today I shared the links quite earlier, 5 minutes, 10 minutes before. Um, that's how uh, we are working on. Okay. So all is good, video is good, everything is good. So today uh, we will uh, be dealing with uh, basically um, um, your, your basics of microscopes then we go to the advanced level with a scanning electron microscope uh, transmission electron microscope dark field phase contrast so there are many microscopes um, for 3d imaging for crystallizations uh, for every application there are different type of microscopes so we will touch each of them then we will come to your cell culture uh, what are the requirements for your cell culture how it should be done aseptically um, what are the various kinds of uh, cultures you can do what are the various cell plates that are available to do so how it is done then at the end uh, after finishing with microscope and cell culture I will try to merge them together uh, through my master's thesis that I did in Germany at the Max Planck Institute of Heart and Lung Research so there uh, so there uh, we did um, a very nice you know uh, work on the cancer cells uh, which was related to um, yeah, I will I will I will let you know it was about transmigration metastasis how uh, cancer is being transferred from one uh, space one place to another place uh, through the blood vessels so we will discuss about that so what is CDK plays role in oncogenesis but I have to Google this I'm, I cannot be uh, be so sure about each uh, genes what they are playing cyclines and CDKs okay so they play uh, signature of cancer cells okay controls entry into exit form okay they, they mainly deals with your cell cycle actually so how you're there entering into um, your you know my in meiosis uh, various cycles so they control that part so i'm not that expert in this uh, with cdk how they're working so my my phd was mainly done in the cardiac uh, physiology uh, with redox regulation of pp1 in heart failure so how one phosphatases could play ro a role as a redox regulators could play so so we will not waste our time today much so i will try um, to cover everything uh, by today so that it should not go to the next day so each day whatever we are learning it should be covered uh, nicely and, and briefly so let's start you might have done this in your in your uh, basics of in, in your college time but still i feel like to touch this part that before we go that everyone should be understand what how a microscope basically works then from that part we will go to the advanced part so it helps to magnify your objects so these are the various bodies that it has it has a body tube nose piece objective stage clips diaphragm light at the bottom fine adjustment base course adjustment stage is there arm is there ocular lens eyepiece so this is how um, your whole uh, your whole um, microscopes looks like yeah so there are three types of microscope one is simple microscope which has only one lens and there's a compound microscope it has two sets of lenses uh, so it can magnify 100 200 times and there's electron microscope it could magnify to your 300 
thousand times. So they are the they are the one to use electrons to enlarge the image. So there are parts of microscope that is ocular lens, your uh, your eyepiece. Then there's a coarse adjustment, the large knob on the microscope that you turn to bring the object into focus. Then there's a fine adjustment that is to adjust that brings the image into the focus. So that's there all are arranged like this. Then different parts of microscope. Uh, then comes the arm, body tube uh, and the nose piece. So all these parts includes um, into your body tube, nose piece, arm. Then comes your high power objective lens will have usually 40x or 100x up to and the low power lens will have only 3x to 4x magnification and middle power will have around 10x to 20x. So there are three kind of lenses you will have that is 40x, 3x, 4x, 10x or 20x. So like this. Then the flat part below objective lens with a slide is placed. The part then this is where we the clip is the one which doesn't move and the diaphragm is that controls the amount of light entering the field of view. Then there's a light source under that uh, which provides the view of it. And then there's a base which provides the rest of the microscope supports to it. So let's start what is what on the top right hand side is ocular lens then on the left is your your body tube then is your nose piece then is your objective stage clips diaphragm light arm stage coarse adjustments fine adjustments and base so this is how your whole um, microscope is arranged the reason behind to show you this basic uh, understanding of microscope because but that's the basic skeleton of your microscopes looks like and all other microscopes are based on this and, and just the lenses are, are, are changed sometimes you are using laser light to magnify things or we are using electron light to use uh, to magnify our things so that's how uh, in each part things are different but that, that's the basic thing that you have to remember um, while learning about the microscope so we can see a uh, field, what do we see in the microscope? It's mostly what we see in the simple compound microscope is upside down. So E is upside down. So, and what you see from 7x to 10x, you see some magnifying images. So if you see these uh, very bulb uh, metastatic styles here, after the magnifications, they looks like this. And what's the power? It's the power of magnifications. Multiply the power of ocular lens by the power of uh, objective lens. So this is how you calculate your power of magnification. So if it is uh, 10x, then you multiply uh, with the 40x to, to get the answer. So this is how you can calculate. You have to find the power of lens. Yeah, it is found on the side of the lens. You can see. Magnification power of lens is always identified by the label X. So it is 10X, 1000X like this. So multiply the power of eyepiece by the power of objective lens. There are three examples of it. So if it is 10X, then object eyepiece uh, is 10X and your objective lens is 100X. If it is 10x is eyepiece and 50x is objective lens, then you multiply them together. So 10x multiplied by 100x or 10x multiplied by 50x. So it will be uh, 500x or 1000x. So that will be the magnification of your uh, microscope. So objective looks at upside down and backward uh, in this case. So whenever you got a chance to do microscope, please use it. So that's the, um, and you can record many observations out of it. Uh, that was experiments that we used to do in our college, but you don't have to do it now. And yeah, one more thing, when you have to mount a slide, like you have to observe a sample, then you put one oil, or immersion oil on, on top. Then you put your sample with the help of tweezers. And then you put your cover slip at 45 degrees Celsius, then slowly you put on, on top of it and you see the results. 
So use traverser to lay specimens with a drop of water. So gently touch the cover slip to edge of the drop of water to cover the specimen of the water. So that's how it is done. We discussed. So one joke here, uh, being showing you as a mutant genes in the microscope, uh, having a three pairs of legs instead of two. So it's a mutant genes. I hope you understand the joke. So that was a quick review for like five minutes about uh, the basic understanding of microscope. Oh, not this one. Just a second. Quorum sensing involves regulations of gene expression with respect to cell population. Right, right. No, but today's topic, uh, the Vendor Khurmi, today's topic was about cell culture and uh, it's second day. We didn't do it yesterday. That's why we are doing this today. So, Neha Taneja. Yeah, yeah, practical work. Um, so be, please be patient. Uh, things will work gradually. It will evolve um, as things are evolving. So at the moment, we should understand because the, the course content that I have made is according to your book called as um, yeah, Wilson and Walker. So there they have divided these contents. First, you understand the basics of, of molecular biology. Then you understand about the cell culture and, 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 and microscope. Then over over coming days you will be taking I will take you to the more about molecular biology, uh, prote proteomics part, and then um, facts analysis also. Then Western blotting. So each things will be done in in detailed manner. So don't worry. So just be patience. Okay. So now a little bit about light and electron microscope. me here yeah so light and electron microscopy so here you can see uh, a replica of a van Leeuwenhoek uh, from 1632 to 1723 uh, a very basic uh, basics of microscope at that time how they were they were using uh, during his time and then this is a replica of uh, Culpeper tripod microscope uh, by the Edmund Culpeper and it's been at the moment in the Texas uh, University uh, in the in the uh, Galveston so it's been like the mirror is there at the bottom and, and your microscope looks like in the wooden box. So we will be dealing in this part with types of microscopy, light microscopy and electron microscopy. In the light we will be conducting with the bright field, dark field, phase contrast, polarizing, DIC, epifluorescence, confocal laser scanning. So all these parts seven we will be dealing and then in the electron two types scanning and transmission. Those who ever uh, has been studying biotechnology or being part of uh, biochemistry uh, techniques or molecular biology, you might have uh, in your initial layers one subject called analytical techniques in biotechnology or something like this. So there in the first unit or two second units, uh, there's always been a lecture of microscope where you have to understand the difference between scanning and transmission microscope how uh, polarizing uh, microscopy is different to phase contrast microscope. 
So all these questions are being asked also in the net exams who was preparing uh, related to microscopy. So this will be quite nice, uh, nice apt uh, explanation of each microscopy uh, in detail applications and what are their advantages or disadvantages respective to them. Then after these microscopy, we will be dealing with the specimen preparation that is a light microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy. So how do we prepare specimen for each part? Like we cannot just prepare a sample uh, for any microscopy just like uh, the same way that we are doing for the light microscopy. For scanning, it will be different. For transmission, it will be different way in, as compared to the light microscopy. So microscopes have been very quite essential to cell biologists. Because uh, as we have discussed on our first day that DNA is making your RNA and RNA is making your uh, proteins. But in reality, uh, we can check them with the help of Western blots with electrophoresis, gel, elect uh, agros gel electrophoresis. Um, but how they are uh, different from the, how they are different actually, they could help us to know things in reality. So this is where the microscope plays role. So whether when your DNA is being made and it's being uh, transformed to messenger RNA and then from uh, transcribing to messenger RNA, it's going out of the nucleus uh, to the cytoplasm to make your protein body with the help of ribosomes. So all these things that, that are happening could only be seen uh, not with the, with the help of, you know, with our eyes. So to, to see that part, like how... Um, Microscopy is, is working. So how microscopy uh, is working, it has to be uh, work like this. So for that, uh, let me show you. Um, let me show you. That will be a good video to initiate our our work here. Yeah, this one. So before we start with uh, your transcription and translation, how they work, that we will be not dealing here, but I want to show you how basics basics of your transcription and translation is happening in reality because these things we can check with the help of your uh, electrophoresis and all these with the bands and dna pattern but with the help of microscopy you can see the reality how one protein is moving from your nucleus to cytoplasm to do its role or how uh, let's say uh, golgi body trafficking is happening from er to the uh, golgi body for the uh, folding of your proteins. So all these things are only possible with the help of your processes that all living things use to read the information in DNA and build proteins. Each gene in a cell's DNA codes for a specific protein. During transcription, cells make a copy of a gene out of mRNA. During translation, they use that mRNA copy as a blueprint to build proteins out of amino acids. These proteins perform the tasks that make living things function. The flow of genetic information from DNA to mRNA to protein is central to life. Very nice, very apt. Uh, that what we have discussed just now. Let's see the practical part of it. Let's choose a gene. Let's choose this gene. Transcription. Inside the nucleus, RNA polymerase attaches to a gene. It separates the two complementary DNA strands, exposing the gene's unique sequence of bases. So as, as we know that A, G, C, T, they are made up of our A, G, C, T, that's what the DNA makes. But to make your uh, messenger RNA, your complementary DNA will help to make it. So instead of T here, we will have U here. 
and in, in, in comparison to C we will have G then for G it will be C for A it will be U so like this it will continue when the end of the gene is reached transcription is complete The new strand of mRNA passes out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where translation takes place. The instructions in an mRNA strand are read in groups of three bases called codons. Each codon must be translated, one after another, in order to build a functioning new protein. The key structures in that process are the ribosome and transfer RNA, tRNA. Each tRNA molecule has its own anticodon and a matching amino acid, the building blocks of proteins. To begin translation, a tRNA molecule coded for the amino acid methionine docks with a ribosome. The ribosome attaches to the end of the mRNA strand. It slides along until it finds a start codon, AUG. Through complementary base pairing, the start codon pairs with the anticodon on the tRNA molecule, signaling the beginning of the protein instructions. The methionine molecule is now the first amino acid in the new protein. The ribosome shifts to read the next codon. Each codon is recognized by one of 20 different tRNA molecules. Each type of tRNA carries a different amino acid. The ribosome continues moving along the mRNA strand, one codon at a time, matching it to a complementary tRNA. It adds each amino acid to the growing protein in just the right order. The sequence of amino acids determines the final shape of the protein and the function that it will carry out. Give translation a try. When the ribosome reaches a stop codon, it detaches from the mRNA strand. The chain of amino acids folds into its final form and the new protein is complete. This protein, aminoacyl tRNA synthetase, will now attach the right amino acid to the proper tRNA molecule charging the tRNA so that it can participate in protein synthesis. Each type of amino acid has its own enzyme. The incredible processes of transcription and translation enable cells to carry out all of the functions necessary for life. So I hope uh, this image uh, was very informative and quite helpful to understand the basics of your central dogma. Um, I've been in my college asking to sometimes fourth year students, tell me about central dogma of life. And they are, they are not able to reply to that and, and very like uh, uh, disheartened and very like, you know, that's the very basics. And th that's what the, that what's the, um, make your molecular biology and genetic engineering and biochemistry all stand on. Um, if we are able to understand what is what is doing, how transcription tRNA is working with the help of your ribosomes to produce your various amino acids, uh, we, are, we are able to understand in our brain, okay, this is how things are happening. Now, uh, let's, 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 let's uh, 
so these kind of videos will be coming in between so that's what I said to earlier students um, that things will be done slowly and, 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 and gradually so things will not just come away straight away so it's like we are watching a movie and no no I want to see climax where's the climax so it doesn't it doesn't happen just straightforwardly it will come <laughs> it will come slowly as a story makes uh, when things will be there I will provide to you so don't worry just relax uh, grab some popcorns if you want to otherwise grab some notebooks and pen that will be much better here and then uh, we continue with it okay so why um, so uh, the reason to show you that video was to show you that how uh, things are working at the at the cellular level so it will be very nice to see them uh, where is what is working and this is all possible because of your microscopy so light microscopy the first one um, so it will be more text here and there will be not much videos to that but um, so be patient to do to that also because I have seen with the, with the time students patient is less and they just want to see many graphic graphical things and not so text but please be patient so the bright field is the most common that we use in the uh, in our labs so whosoever is working as a PhD or in the lab so this is where uh, we it helps our day-to-day -day work uh, to, to count your cells to check the morphology of cells how they are growing to check uh, whether uh, your your the the regions that you're adding to them whether they're working or not um, so it's bright field microscope it's named because the microscope field is bright while the object is being viewed in the dark so we have to keep our objective in dark only then we can see in this microscope simple is design simple design is simple uh, we uh, we put light to the specimens to form image unstained specimens have poor contrast stained specimens show excellent contrast so ideal for stained bacteria uh, bright background dark specimens tungstens or halogen light is there so this is what you see uh, with the help of your bright field images some examples so stained blood uh, cells in peripheral blood smear uh, with sections of gut tissues containing ciliated parasites uh, the flagellates trichomonas um, are being used here and then uh, this is the basic design of bright field microscope inverted so this is also very helpful where your objective is downward and your light is coming from the top and you're seeing your your eyepieces from here so that's what I used in my PhD actually to count each cell in the 96 well plate or 8 well plate to see different things so this is also being attached to the robot actually so this automatic machine which will count each uh, wells uh, after some time and give you long videos out of it so that's also quite helpful to show you that um, let me take you to the that how uh, I made one for my PhD thesis so my PhD thesis was working related with the cardiomyocytes that is we were taking uh, cardiac cells from the newly born rats we take the hearts and then we make primary cells out of it and then we want to wash them under microscopes with the various reagents so in particularly I was interested to see how uh, H2O2 which is a redox reagents could lead to the changes in the morphologies of cardiomyocytes so to do so I will not go in detail about my thesis but yes I would like to show you with the help of that inverted microscope I made these 20 minutes videos of four different conditions with 10 100 micromolar 1000 micromolar and 10,000 micromolar of H2O2 so this is the control here you can see how the cells are beating they are all fine at 100 micromolar the morphology looks the same it was not much changed at 1000 micromolar so things started to uh, show some difference uh, so it was not much difference but at 10,000 micromolar everything started to pop out all cells the nucleus was coming out from the cells and cells were dying at that range so this is how you make your experiments planned uh, you go from uh, low concentration to high concentration uh, with different uh, regions to see the effects on the cells and this is where your microscope plays a role so without microscope it's not possible 
and also with the help of microscope um, I would like to take you another oops where does it go yeah that's that's enough I guess so that was the thing I want to show you how um, uh, your bright field microscope in what it could help to make various uh, aspects uh, use of, of, of this field now comes your dark field microscope the dark field microscope creates a dark field around the viewing of the small unstained objects so this is method from the 19th century you have a bright specimen and dark background uh, in back there and the light is not scattered by the specimen bypassing the objective therefore making the field dark can see very small objects but resolution is variable so high contrast good for unstained live motile specimens so in the dark field images, this is how you looks like. This is algae, hydrocotton, reticulum, viewed with the dark field microscopy. And this is a, a leptospira, a spirochete, viewed with the dark field microscopy, like this. Now comes your phase contrast microscopes, which convert differences in the refractive index in specimens to differences in the image brightness. So central portion of light is, in this case, is blocked. So you have a phase objectives here and blue ring at the bottom. And the central portion of the light is blocked in this part, creating a ring of light from the condenser that illuminates the specimen. So the light waves affected by the specimens are slowed by the phase retardation rate, increasing the difference in wavelength between refractive and unrefractive rays. So when the refractive and unrefractive waves are focused, uh, they produce an interference due to the difference in the wavelength. This is known as the difference in the specimen. So this is technology from the 1940 provide high contrast, good resolutions, good for bacteria, flagella, cilia, organelles such as mitochondria. So this is how the phase contrast images looks like uh, on the left. Uh, it's, it's showing you like this. So you're having this, it's showing you my uh, cell with the nucleus inside and the, all, all other organelles being uh, like in small parts like this. So this is unstained squamous epithelial cells absorbed with a phase contrast microscopy. And DIC microscopy, we will discuss about this also later, it's on the right. So differences in the refractive index in various regions of cells count for the contrast in the image. So that's why we see this contrast images because of the change in the uh, refractive index in this case. Now comes your polarization microscopy. Uh, in this, uh, you have a polarizer at the bottom of a specimen, uh, at the bottom and the top also on both, and your specimen is in between. So this detects the specimens that are biofringent, that is having characteristics of double refraction. Um, the specimen is placed between two polarizers crossed at 90 degree to each other. So there are two polarizers uh, stating at 90 degree to each other. And then we have a very bright image, dark background in this, uh, used for very highly crystal structures, minerals, uh, like this. So you're having these structures being from the Martian Metroid. Uh, on the left, what we are seeing is from the Mars, some metrods came to Earth, and that's what we are seeing with the help of polarizing microscope. And on the on the right uh, is the renal epithelial cells containing fat globules in this. And in the bottom right is the high magnifications of uh, of same cells of these ones uh, with polarizing microscope, showing typical Maltese cross. So you have in this Maltese cross uh, in these epithelial cells that we are seeing able to see when we zoom in a little bit more so every so what we are seeing so far in these is in contrast polarizing microscope uh, dark field uh, microscope or in this bright field microscope that every every um, thing has its own applications and as per whatever the scientists are looking for whatever the scientist has their needs uh, they will add according to that Then comes your epifluorescence microscope, allows the detection of molecules and ions within the cells. Fluorescence uh, dyes absorb short wavelength of light and emit longer wavelengths. So there are barriers, filters and diacrotic uh, prisms select the excitations wavelength which strike the specimen exclude the excitation wavelength from the detector. So we use UV light as a source in this, uh, like maybe mercury or xenon arc lamp. And it's high contrast, high resolution images are coming out of this. You have a black background, uh, no condenser is required, multiple fluorescent probes are available. 
So you have a UV light, mainly in the amplifluorescence, you have a UV light source in this. And there's a barrier filters and dichromic prisms also present. So here you can see a very nice image uh, using fluorescent dye, that is your fluorescein isocythinate is being used, which is uh, emitting green light in dark. So we have stained this with antibody to our cells to the cell membrane surface antigens. So what you are seeing is outside the cell membrane antigens being very nicely being glowing in the in the dark. And this is the in the, in the, in the bright field. This is how it looks like. But uh, with the with the after the labeling with the fits uh, or in English in fits we say uh, this is how your tetrahymena uh, looks like. This is also another image with epifluorescence image showing your metaphase. You can see very nice metaphasic plate uh, being spindle fibers on the side. Uh, and so you can see there are three different dyes are being used. One for the chromosome, one for the spindle fibers and one for the cytoskeleton of your cell. So there are three different dyes are being used in this case. So for the red we use keratin, the red is the keratin filaments, yellows are the spindle apparatus. And the red, uh, the blue part is your chromosomes, metaphasic chromosomes. So this is how your epifluorescent, epifluorescent uh, microscopy could help to, to show you uh, various various figures, various images um, of your uh, meiosis or mitosis in detailed manner. And this was, believe me, was not possible uh, 100 years ago. So this was that because of the recent techniques recent technology uh, being emerged uh, using the various fluorescent dye from the jellyfish from the deep sea that we are getting. Uh, we are able to get those uh, primary antibodies and then secondary wash uh, uh, antibodies to check them and see them in the dark uh, and we are able to see these images. So it's not just the, the, uh, the, the microscopy is playing a big role, it's also the science behind these dyes also. It's a very interesting chemistry behind that how uh, we can bring different colors and, and bring them into their eyes to see the, the, the cytoskeleton, spindle fiber and metachromosomes, all these three different structures in one thing. When we, are, when we were in the earlier days able to see these microscopes in under the microscope the cell, we were just able to see a black and white field how your chromosomes being separated. And we are not able to differentiate between your spindle fibers or cytoskeleton of the cell. But this has been only possible in the recent years, uh, having different colors dyes and able to see uh, at the different wavelengths. So there's also um, okay, all is good. Um, So I want to show you one thing here, there is a protein called ATF6, here you can see that ATF6 uh, is being migrated to Golgi body and then from Golgi it's going to nucleus and this is happening whenever there is an endoplasmic reticulum stress is happening, ER stress is happening um, in, the, in the Golgi and because of that you see these effects. So this is how I checked with the various antibodies within the, within the cells of cardiomyocytes, NRCMs, neonatal red cardiomyocytes, that ATF6 in the normal conditions in the control siRNA was present, was outside the cell. But when I did the knockdown of uh, one protein called CTGF with siRNA, it goes inside the nucleus. And once it's inside the nucleus, um, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, proved that, that ATF6 is, is the reason for the ER stress um, as in the body. So this is, you can see, I color the DAPI uh, dye with the blue and the ATF6 gene with the red and my CTGF uh, being present here with the green. So I merged them all together and this is how the image looks like. So this was done to N equals to scale bar 20 micrometer. So when, whosoever is doing PhD or you will do in the future experiments with the cell culture. So you have to uh, do with the three different dyes, do these experiments again and again to see the clear difference how things are working 
in reality yeah so sorry uh, if i'm switching from uh, one presentation to another presentation because i want to show correlate each things uh, how uh, things are working in reality with the help of these microscopes now comes your differential interference contrast microscope also called as Normansky, Normansky um, optics so you have a prism in this a mercury lamp also beam splitter and polarizing filter so it's a mixture of all the things that we have uh, discussed and it helps to produce you 3d images uh, having a uh, high numerical aperture high contrast and uh, detects changes in the refractive index of specimen so DIC image is a comparison of DIC fluorescent images so top you can see uh, two sites uh, being shown in the 3d structure and in the bottom you can see Balbayani uh, bodies with mitochondrial clouds so So confocal, then comes your confocal laser microscopy. This is uh, being highly used nowadays. And in India, we have uh, very few of your confocal laser uh, scanning microscopy. Not many, um, not many places have it. So in this, a laser is focused on the XY plane. So one light from the plane is focused, reaches a detector. And the scanned image is digitally recorded. So images from consecutive focal planes can be recorded and composite 3D images can be digitally created with the help of this. So there is a Krypton, Argon laser, high resolution shape image, high sensitivity can be used in, in reflectance and eliminates background interference. So you have a BioRad uh, confocal microscope being shown here, showing a fluorescent label cells on the monitor. So this is how the big setups looks like. You have a laser scanner there. And connected to the computer and then you're able to see the direct images uh, in the computer to take it further and this is one also another example of a confocal image uh, you have um, here you can see that there's a left image you have 30 optical sections of trichomonas humulus stain with anti-tubulin and fluorescein isosynthenate and this is how they are being glowing in the dark and this is the image uh, being shown with the unstained version uh, of the same thing so that was about uh, light microscopy and dark microscopy all about that now comes your next microscopy that is electron microscopy that is then within them there are two types scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy so scanning electron microscopy uh, it's a fixed dehydrated specimens are mounted on stuffs and surface coated with the gold uh, palladium or rhodium the specimens are placed in the vacuum and electron beam is scans back and forth over it. The electrons that bounce off the metal coated specimen surface are collected and converted to a digital image displayed on a TV like monitor. So electron beam is focused using a magnetic field and then it's give a 3D image and uh, gives external topography of the specimens and much higher resolutions and magnifications than possible in the light microscope. So here you can see some 3D images, uh, very uh, trichomonas, SCM images and, and also at the bottom uh, the, the, the normal images on the left. So that's how the, that's the big difference between uh, others microscopy. Then comes your transmission. So in this we fix and dehydrate the specimens embedded in the resins hardened sections and stained with the heavy metals such as uranium, lead and saturated into electron column in the microscope. The electron beam is absorbed or deflected to the heavy metal stains and shadows are casted on the uh, film uh, at the bottom of the column. So you will have 2D image which reveals internal cell structure and you have high resolutions, high magnifications. Electron beam is focused by the magnetic field. Now comes the comparisons of uh, TAM and SEM. So on the right, is a, a transmission electron microscope on the left is a scanning electron microscope so we can see clearly TAM gives more uh, inter your cellular organelles more better and we can see much better in that part whereas on the left you can see that we see the 3d image that's good but not in so clearly as compared to TAM is so here's a trachomonas is being shown in, uh, with the help of SAM on the left and the TAM on the right so SAM details of external structure are visible 
while in the TAM we see the internal, internal structures also like Golgi, hydrogonomas, flagellum, all these parts. This is a further various stem photos of uh, rat liver cells on the left and the pancreatic echina cells on the right. So revealing the internal cell structures uh, like nucleus, nucellus, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, cell boundaries, zymogen granules, mitochondria, all these parts. Then this is a specimen preparation. You have light microscopy, scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. So how you prepare your samples? Uh, This is the general schematic for preparation of, just a second, I have to check the timings also because you have 8 o'clock another class. So general schematic for preparing specimens for light microscopy. So you have a live mounts on the left, view with the vital stains and view. And then on the right hand side is a fixed specimen histology. So you have to fix, dehydrate, infiltrate, section, mount, stain and view afterwards. So for the live mounts to view the organisms, you use the live mounts to unstain. Viewing time of live mount is limited. Unstained specimens have low contrast. So supra vital stains may be applied to provide more contrast or identify certain components. And these are stains that are not harmful to living cells. So fixed preserve specimens for histology, the study of tissues. So specimens may be preserved using chemicals such as formalin, acetic acid, ethanol and methanol. So fixations immobilize molecules such as proteins and lipids. So fixed specimens are dehydrated by serial transfer through the sending alcohol series to 1% alcohol. Then they are infiltrated with the melted uh, paraffin, paraffin substitutes or plastics placed in the mold to harden. So specimens are cut into 5 to 10 micrometer with thick section using steel knife or razor with an instrument called microtome. So what you do is you take uh, your your organ that you look for want to see the sections of it you put them in the paraffin paraffin uh, film and then with the help of this microtome you can take some small sections and you put them on the slide and then you can see the various uh, structures with the help of microscope later on and then this is for the scanning electron microscope you fix it dehydrate mount on the stubs uh, sputurate coat and observe later on so fixation, fixatives used are glutaraldehyde, paraformaldehyde, osmium tetroxide and for dehydration is accomplished by carrying the specimens through ascending alcohol series to 100% alcohol then to organic solvents such as acetone, propylene oxides, all these. So specimens are mounted on aluminium stubs using sticky tapes. So example of one of these stubs, uh, you can use these stubs to, to, to check your things out. Then you see your image with the help of, uh, yeah. This is an also another method for the TAM. It's also similar. Fix, dehydrate, infiltrate, section, apply sections to grids, stains, and then you observe it. So this is showing you various methods. You first fixate it, then dehydrate it, then infiltrate the epoxy resins. Then you check, you cut it your samples with the ultra microtome. Um, then this is how your various ultra thin sections of these will be coming out uh, for your transmission electron microscopy and then with the help of these tweezers you can bring these heavy metal stains on top and then uh, this is how the uh, main pictures looks like to go for further okay so that's it for the from the microscopy point of view uh, this I will not share my presentation Mainly I will share with you now is microscopy. Yeah. Where 
is your this part. So I think uh, I cannot continue further because uh, you will have your classes uh, at 8 o'clock. So if I start one topic, we might not able to finish on time. So there are some of students might be having classes later. So today I want to start with principles of cell culture actually, with animal cell culture. Because once we are done with the microscopy it's time to go for further next part so we are done for today i think we will not continue further and thank god streaming works good in this weather and and in this town also i'm very happy Uh, Diksha, because infiltration is quite important, otherwise you will not see the images, so it's, it's quite... Uh, so summary, cell culture might be not possible because uh, it's, it's meant for maybe for one class only, we, are, we went quite details with many things, so it might be not possible. So what is the difference between super vital stains and other vital stains? Super vital stains, supra vital stains. Uh, Prashant, in which context you are saying, uh, from a microscopy point of view, like, or um, another way, could you be more elaborated in that part, please? So any further questions, I think we are done for today. So the recorded lectures, you will have it there. So tomorrow we will start with the cell culture. Um, so we might be finishing, the, it was told that it will be finishing on 25th, but uh, we might, we might, uh, we might, uh, you know, um, keep it um, before um, if, if the time allows us. It's because um, we each day one hour. So I might also take, if you're okay, I might take your classes over the weekend um, because I will be free over the weekend and I'm, I'm not into so much of weekend off. If you all insist me to continue uh, during the weekends also, I will be happy. Otherwise, we will continue uh, with, with the weekdays only. With the weekdays only. There's a, I have to check, but I'm not so much aware of this. Supra vital stains. I might be aware of this, but it's not coming to my mind. No, I never done this actually. Sorry, I, I am not aware of this topic, but it's good that you brought, brought to us uh, today's topic. Super vital stain uh, is, is a drop or segment. Uh -huh. So it's always good to read from the sciencedirect.com because uh, they are the, you can see some papers in this and, and getting knowledge from them will be the best way to go for. So super vital staining of a drop of sediments with a drop of staining solution in fresh cytological. Mm -hmm. This is a way of uh, dealing how, how you can stain them. If you want to take the rest of the classes, then you can take the class on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, I can take your weekends classes also. Um, I, have, I have no problem in it. In it. So in the evening, actually my college is from Monday to Sunday or Monday to Saturday. So in the evening on Sunday, taking your classes will be not a big deal for me. So we, we will continue like this then. 
and most probably it's 54 students I can see now actually so most probably it will decrease in upcoming days so we might also switch to um, Google Meet actually if you want otherwise because as we have 170 students so we, we are not sure if some some dates more than 100 so on google meet we cannot have more than 100 students so it's not possible us to continue like that so so that's it students for today i hope you had a good learning from the microscope point of view various microscopy understandable to difference between scanning and transmission electron microscopy how you can see the different structures is I've showed you various examples how the specimens looks like. Uh, please go through these lectures again one more time and yeah, try to give me your assignments also. And let's see um, to see you on tomorrow. Um, if everything is good, <laughs> all is good, we will see us again tomorrow. Yeah, nice uh, talking to you all and uh, nice teaching you all also. Uh, and uh, and it's always. Uh, learning keep learning students from each and every every part of your life keep learning and keep conquering it also uh, keep feeling thank you so much off to here uh, good luck with your next sessions whosoever gonna have now uh, the rest students go for assignment okay oh, Bhumika Sharma roll number 13 why is your roll number 13 your name it's funny uh, roll number 13 uh, Hardi Shukdia, Hardi Shukdia. It's not compulsory, but if you do it, you will make a good habit. Actually, whatever you are learning, just go and go to your home before sleep. Just write down, type down your computer, and just send it. So you will have a very good practice of learning and making notes. So this this is I all always do also for myself. Which side I didn't understand. Okay, students, I got to go. Go for your next class. We see us tomorrow, same time, same place. Take care. Bye-bye.